All right, so this lesson in uh, Unit 4 is about dynamic equilibrium. This is the introduction lesson uh, to the whole unit, which will focus on equilibrium. So we're going to learn what exactly is equilibrium, some properties of equilibrium, um, something called the e equilibrium law, and finally, the equilibrium constant. All right, so all about equilibrium. So what is equilibrium? Equilibrium in English means equal. Right, so it's like a balance. So, for example, if two countries are trading with each other, uh, basically throwing stuff at each other, um, eventually, if things go right, they're going to reach equilibrium, meaning that the amount of import versus the amount of export should relatively be the same. Otherwise, you're just paying one country a lot of money, which is what U.S. was doing to China. Uh, U.S imports a lot of Chinese stuff, but exports very little. So Trump got pissed, like we're just paying China every year. He got pissed, trade war. So equilibrium is when things that go between two different places become equalized so that nothing changes overall. Does that make sense? If I were to give you $10 and you give $10 back to me, well, nothing is happening because we still have each $10, despite the fact that we're giving each other money. Okay, so that is equilibrium. When things going in one direction is exactly equal to the things coming right back. So what does that have to do with chemistry? Well, so up until now, we assume that chemical reactions proceed to completion, meaning that one of the reactants run out. Okay, but this doesn't always happen. Okay, sometimes the reaction can go in reverse so that you will never run out of reactants. So consider this, you have NO2, um, this is a synthesis reaction, so two molecules of NO2 combine together to make N2O4. And NO2 has a color, <coughs> excuse me, it is a brown gas, and N2O4 is a colorless gas. A polluted city is going to look brown and hazy in the atmosphere because of high concentrations of NO2. And that is a lung irritant. If you breathe that in, that combines with water to make nitric acid, which is terrible. So this brown gas will combine together, will synthesize into a colorless gas. So if you expect a reaction of NO2 to proceed, then it should you know, gradually decrease in the hue of brownness. So in figure A, you have pure NO2, so it's a crimson red dark brown gas. But as time progresses, as the synthesis reaction occurs, in the second picture, you have one molecule of N2O4. So the hue of the brown becomes lighter, okay? But in figure C and figure D, just compare the two, what happened? You would expect this to go all the way to completion so the brown gas will eventually become lighter and lighter and lighter become colorless gas but at c um, you have three molecules of n2o4 so you have a light brown so okay that's that's yellow now it's a yellow gas but then d has also three molecules of n2o4 so the q did not change it's still the same color Okay, it never actually becomes colorless because the reaction never finishes. It reached chemical equilibrium. It means it will stay that way forever. Well, until you change the conditions, but if you don't, it will stay that way forever. So equilibrium is not really staying the same, okay? It's not exactly nothing. So basically, an equilibrium is a state in which the reactants and products have reached constant concentrations. Or that means their concentrations no longer change. And this can only occur in a closed system. If you have an open system, then things can come in, things can go out, you're not going to get equilibrium. So equilibrium has to be in closed system. This doesn't mean no change. Okay, just because the concentrations don't change doesn't mean nothing is happening. So this is why it's called dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is the result of a balance 
between forward and reverse processes. They occur at equal rates so that nothing really happens as a whole. If you just look at this from the outside, overall, you see no change. But in fact, chemical reactions are happening all the time. It's just that whatever you lose, you get right back. All right, it's like um, money, for example. Like the, the $10 example I gave you, I give you $10 and give me $10. It, well, it looks like on the outside, we're not really doing anything, but in fact, we are exchanging money. We are generating GDP. We're stimulating the economy. So something is happening. It's just overall, the net gain for both of us is zero. So that's dynamic equilibrium. Okay. Processes go in forward and reverse directions. And if they're equal, you see no overall change. That's equilibrium. All right. So you can reach equilibrium when you have the rate of the forward reaction being exactly the same as the rate of the reverse reaction. All right, so forward and reverse, identical. In this case of the nitrogen dioxide example, you start with all nitrogen dioxide. So if we look at figure B, and zero and 204. But this will eventually reach equilibrium and the concentrations of both gas will reach a plateau and they will be a flat line from that point onwards. Notice that this doesn't mean that the product equal to the reactant. No, no, that's a very common mistake. The concentrations of the product and reactant remain the same. It doesn't mean they're equal to each other. They can be different but remain the same. Okay. Now, why does this happen? Okay, well, why would something just reach equilibrium? Well, consider this. We learned rate of reaction in the last unit. Okay, we know that higher concentration means higher rate of reaction. So, in the beginning, you only have NL2. You don't have any molecules of N2O4. So, obviously, the reaction can only go in one direction from there. But once it starts, the high concentration of NL2 will start to react with each other. The rate of reaction will be fast in the beginning. But as you produce more products, you will lose reactants and you will reduce the concentration of NL2. So as the concentration of NL2 declines, so will the rate of reaction because you're losing NL2. You're decreasing the concentration, so you will decrease the rate of reaction. So the rate of reaction of NL2 will gradually decline, hence explained by the red curve. Now the blue curve, as you're making the product, you are gaining in concentration. And as you increase the concentration, you will increase the rate of reaction in the opposite direction. And 204 is also spontaneously broken back into NL2. And the rate can only increase because you're making more and more N204 from the forward reaction. Now eventually, the rate of the forward reaction will decrease to a point where it, it is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, which will increase until that point. So they will meet in the middle. At that moment, they will have equal rates. If you have equal rate of the forward equals to the rate of the re reverse, nobody's winning. You're not making more of any particular substances. It's a trade-off. I make one of you, you, you change it right back. So the concentrations will no longer change and this will reach equilibrium. Okay, does this idea make sense to you guys? If not, please ask. I have a question for the concentration. Like, can they both be the same? Like in like in the concentration graph, like can they have the same line that is like, um, yes, oh. they could, you know, coincidentally have the same concentration and equilibrium. But again, that is one of many possibilities. Probably not, you see what I mean? Mm. Yeah. So yeah. most of the time, they're not the same. Um, their absolute concentrations do not have to be equal, but they could be equal. There's nothing stopping them from being equal, but you know, that's rare. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but I'm uh, talking about the rate of change of the concentration should both be zero. None of them are increasing, none of them are decreasing. They remain constant, but they could have different concentrations, just the same um, rate. Oh, if yeah. the rate is not same, they're not in equilibrium, right? 
Yeah, if the rate of reaction forward and reverse are not the same, well, you know, they're still progressing and they will eventually become the same. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so dynamic equilibrium has the following three properties. You need to know this. Equilibrium is achieved when opposing changes are equal. Okay, rate of forward equals the rate of reverse. We talked about that many times. Also, the observable or macroscopic properties of the system are constant. Okay, it, we are macroscopic beings looking at microscopic interactions on a molecular level. So according to us, nothing is happening because we can't see molecules. We can just see the color of the solution or the volume, or whatever. But what we observe is that nothing is happening. Nothing is going on. But that doesn't really mean nothing is happening. It's just that we're not observing anything that is different on a large scale. But microscopically, reactions are happening constantly. It's just that the rates are the same. And for us, it makes no difference. Okay. Equilibrium can only be achieved in a closed system. That means you can't have any input or output of matter. The amount of total matter remains the same, then you can have equilibrium. If not, if your vial has like an opening, well, the gas would just escape, like there is no equilibrium, okay? So let's look at this mathematically. Okay? There's gonna be a lot of math in this unit, and you pretty much gonna have to do the same math over and over again, so it gets, easier. It is intimidating at first, like, what, what is all this? But you know, it's the same thing. Okay, so you have N2O4 becoming NO2. So here's the table. The two tables compare two different experiments, and it displays the initial and final concentration. Just carefully look at the table. Well, the initial concentration in experiment one or in 204, well, you have 0.75 moles per liter. The unit is big M, moles per liter. And you have no NO2, zero. When you reach equilibrium, you get those two numbers. However, if you reverse this in experiment two, you have none of N204, but all NO2, and you have 1.5 moles per liter. Oh, look, you have the same final concentration. So what does this tell you, guys? What does it tell you about the concentration and equilibrium? People? It's like, is it like when one um, compound like decreases the concentration, the other one in increases? Like in the first experiment, like I know N2O4 yes. okay. decrease, decreases, but NO2 increases. And then the other one, experiment two, and N2O4 increases and NO2 um, decreases. That's well, yes, you're right. Um, that has to happen because you're not going to decrease from zero, right? But look at the numbers in the final concentration between experiment one and one and two. They're both the same. Like they're the same. Mm -hmm. Why are they the same? Because I started with different conditions and I let them both reach equilibrium. And it turns out that they're the same. All right. Now this is because I used very specific numbers. 0 0.75 for N2O4 and 1.5 for NO2. And if you compare those two numbers, 1.5 is twice of 0 0.75. And if you look at the balanced equation, for every one mole of N2O4, you have two moles of NO2. Okay, if I match the mole ratio, it doesn't matter which one I have at what concentration in the beginning, they will always reach the same concentration at equilibrium. All right, so here in this picture, this explains it really well. 
you will reach the same equilibrium regardless of which direction the reaction is going. You can start with all of one thing and have none of the other and let it just react. It will reach equilibrium with two numbers. And you can do this again, except you reverse the thing, but you have to abide by mole ratios. You have all of one other thing and none of the other. And you let this happen, it will reach the exact same equilibrium with the exact same concentrations. Okay, so it doesn't matter from which direction do you reach equilibrium, left or right, you will reach the same concentrations, the same equilibrium. Right, does that make sense? It will always equalize at this concentration under the same conditions, of course. You can't change, let's say, the temperature. So the math, um, we need to calculate concentrations at equilibrium. Um, with the math, you will have to do something called the ice table. The ice, I is for initial, C is for change, E is for equilibrium concentrations. And the ice table will look something like this. This is just an example I just pulled out from the internet. You will write your equation on top, and then you will go I, C, and E. In the first row, you will fill out all of the initial concentration as given to you in the question. Change, well, they will change to become equilibrium, but you don't know how much they change. We use the letter X to denote the change. Okay, and the coefficients of X should match the balanced equation. Finally, to calculate the equilibrium concentration, you just add up the initial and change, you will find the equilibrium concentration and you solve for X using algebra. Okay, we're gonna be doing a lot of these questions, but for today, we're just going to practice how to use an ice table. And these examples are too easy that I will not put them on the test. I'll tell you right now that these two examples will not be on the test. It is just for us to be familiar with this type of strategy using an ice table. So here's example one. You have this reaction H2 plus F2, you get 2HF at SATP. If the reaction begins with one mole per liter of H2 and F2 and no HF, calculate the concentrations of H2 and HF at equilibrium if we know that the equilibrium concentration of F2 is 0 0.24 moles per liter. So right off the bat, the question gives you four values. You know everybody initially, and you know the concentration of F at equilibrium, find everybody else. All right, this question is easy because it gives you a lot of information. It gives you excess information to make the calculation really easy. A realistic question will be what we're gonna study uh, two lessons from now, where you don't have all of this information, but you can still do it. So all we have to do is draw the ice table, fill out the table. So initially you have one moles per liter of H2. By the way, the units for the ice table, always, always, capital M, moles per liter. It is the unit of concentration. You can't use moles, you cannot use gram. It has to be moles per liter. Okay, so it's one moles per liter hydrogen, one moles per liter fluorine, zero for HF because it says you don't have it in the beginning. We also know that at equilibrium, we have 0.24. So all we have to do is figure out the rest of the table. All right, and like I said before, for change, you don't know how much change. So you use X as a variable. And since you have no product, you have one mole, one mole of reactant, one mole per liter, zero moles per liter product, I mean, you don't have it. The reaction must progress to make more products. So you will lose reactants to make more products if you subtract X from both H and F, okay? And they must be equal. They have a one-to-one -one ratio. Every time you consume one F, you will consume one H. There's no question about that. So they both subtract the same number. And how much HF would you make? Well, for every one mole of H, you will make two moles of HF. So you plus two X, does that make sense? So now all we have to do is solve for X in order to solve for the equilibrium concentration. 
So obviously for H2, it's gonna be 0 0.24, duh. It's the same thing. For every mole of F you consume, you consume one mole of H. So of course the concentrations and equilibrium will be the same thing. So it's gonna be 0 0.24. What about HF at equilibrium? Well, all we have to do is solve for X. HF is just two X. You do the math. 1 minus x is 0 0.24, you solve for x, you double that, boom, 1.52. So this is very rudimentary math. You literally just do addition and you multiply by 2. Okay, do you guys understand how this works? How to use an ice table to solve for equilibrium concentrations. Um, can you please go over like the part of like negative x and then plus 2x, please? Okay, why is it negative x? Well, yeah. it's negative x because this reaction will result in the consumption of H2 and F2. Now you have one mole per liter of each, you have no product. So if you just let this sit, it's gonna make products. Right? So you will lose reactants to make more products. Right? Doesn't matter what you do, you're gonna lose H and F. So that means you will lose both of the products at the same rate because they're the same coefficient. But how much, I don't know. So I use X. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you will gain products twice the amount as the one you lost because according to the balanced equation, for every one mole of reacting, you make two moles of products. So it's plus two X. You know that it's plus because you started with zero. Okay, you can't go lower than that, so you must go up from there. So that's why it's minus x for the reactant plus for the products. Okay, thank Good. you. Yeah. All right, so for example two, this is essentially the same type of problem, just with different numbers and a different equation. Please uh, take like a minute to Draw the ice table, figure this out, and then I'll take it up. Keep in mind that the ice table has to have units of moles per liter. Right, so you have NH3 decomposes into it, um, H2. You start with four moles of ammonia. It is introduced into a two liter rigid container. Rigid means the volume of the container won't change. It's not like a balloon, okay? It's glass or something. And then you heat this to a particular temperature, which is not important. Then the amount of NH3 changes to two moles to determine the equilibrium concentration of the other two. Okay, keep in mind that this has to be moles per liter, so you gotta divide to make moles per liter, not just use the moles. So go ahead and try this, and I'll take this up in like one minute. All right, so all we have to do is draw the ice table, fill it out, and then we can see what the answer is. So initially, you have two moles per liter of ammonia, not four because you got to divide by the two liters. The question doesn't say you have N and H. If it doesn't say, you assume you don't have it. Okay, so zero and zero. And also, the final equilibrium concentration of ammonia is uh, one mole per liter because it's two over two. Find everybody else. You might make the mistake of not having the two and the three in your x's. Uh, make sure that the x's have the same coefficients as your balanced equation. Since you have no products, you will make products. So you will lose reactants. So for NH3, you subtract the x. And for the N2 and H2, you add the x because there's no way to subtract zero. So you minus two x plus x for the N, plus 3x to the h. So now it's a matter of solving for x. Uh, and this is like a grade six math problem. You move this around and you solve for, for x, x is 0.5. So two minus two x equals to one, so x must be 0.5. X is the concentration of nitrogen. So this is 0.5. And three x will be the concentration of hydrogen. You just times three, so it's 1.5. All right, you put that back. The equilibrium concentration of nitrogen is there 4.5, of hydrogen is 1.5, and we're done. 
Okay, very simple. Any questions? All right, good. In two lessons, we will do this again, except this time you won't be given any numbers in the equilibrium concentration. And then you can still do it. It's just a harder question. All right, but before we get there, we need to learn this, something called equilibrium law. So consider that balanced equation right there. A plus B, you get C plus D. The lowercase a, b, c, d are the coefficients for or the balanced chemical equation. You can represent the equilibrium with an expression. Okay, equilibrium is just this. It is a ratio of the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. Okay, it is the product of the products divided by the products of the reactants. Just take all of the products, multiply them all together, divide by all the reactants, multiply together. You do have to raise the concentrations to their respective coefficients. Okay, it's to the power of A, B, C, D, depends on what you are. Please don't forget that. Now, a common mistake is you, just, you did this and you forgot the powers. Why? Well, because this is the products of all of your products over the products of all of your reactants. And you have to multiply all of them together. And if you have, let's say, two as your coefficient, that means you got two of those. You got to multiply that by itself. So that means squared. If you have three, then you have to multiply that by itself three times, which is cubed. So you just raise to the power of your coefficient. And you should have the KEQ expression or the equilibrium law expression. Well, KEQ is a constant called the equilibrium constant. This constant does not have units. It has no meaning. Okay, so you don't have to write units. It depends on the power, so who cares? This tells you something about the equilibrium. It represents ratio of products to reactants. All right, and this KEQ is going to be the same unless you change the temperature. Okay, you will have the same equilibrium constant if you have the same reaction. Regardless of concentration, the ratio will always be the same except when you change temperature. Okay, so you need to know the equilibrium constant expression, this. And you need to know how to write this. And let's investigate the constant a little bit more. H2 plus I2, you get 2HI. Here's our reaction. Somebody did this three times. In the first step, uh, trial one, you have two moles per liter of H, two moles per liter of I, no product. You let this run and you get that result at equilibrium. And then you do this again for trial two, but this time you have all product, no reactants, and you get that. Lastly, you do this again with I and HI, but no hydrogen and you let it run to equilibrium, and you get that. All of this were done at a constant temperature of 485. The, the number doesn't matter. We just have to know that it is constant. So look at the equilibrium concentrations. Do you see a pattern? Do these, random seem, uh, do, do these numbers seem random, or do you see a pattern? Anyone? First of all, are they all the same? Folks? Um. In trial one, the initial concentration of H2 and um, I2 is the same. So they have the same equilibrium concentration. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and then it's also the same thing for trial two. Right. Because they started the same, they ended the same, which makes sense. All right. 
What other pattern do you see? I'll give you a hint. Compare between the different trials. If you just look at trial one and trial two, those numbers that might be a little hard to see because these doubled? yes, it's doubled. Trial one has doubled the numbers of trial two. The reason for that is quite simple because look in the initial concentrations, you had two moles per liter of H and I for trial one. But for trial two, if you want to copy trial one, you should have four moles per liter of HI. But you only have two. That means you divide it by two, which means your equilibrium concentration also divides by two. All right. They're in fact the same equilibrium constant. If you actually calculate the KEQ using the KEQ expression, like here, you can substitute each row of numbers and get the KEQ for all of them. So let's do it for the first one. You have to choose the equilibrium concentrations here. This is KEQ at equilibrium. So the concentrations must be at equilibrium. You plug in the first row, you get 49.8. Okay. Doing it again for trial two, the second row, you use the numbers for the second row. Well, oh, what do you know? 98, uh, uh, 49.8, same thing. What about trial three? Because trial three looks wildly different from one and two, right? Uh, they're not like, identical at all. They, they don't have a noticeable pattern. But if you put this in, oh, you get the same KEQ. So the numbers look really random, but the ratios always give you the same KEQ no matter what. So this tells you that the KEQ will always remain the same regardless of what your initial concentrations are. You can have all kinds of messed up numbers. Okay, and they will always get you to the same KEQ as long as the temperature remains the same. Okay, that's the bottom line. You have to have the same temperature. If you change the temperature, you will change the KEQ, but if you don't, there's nothing you can do that will change the KEQ. You can just Use whatever concentration you like, a million moles per liter versus zero, put it in, you get 49.8, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so let's practice writing the equilibrium law. So I have two examples here. N2 plus H2, you get NH3. And then you have NO plus O2, you get NO2. So can you all write the equilibrium law expression or the KEQ expression? I'll give you like a minute and then I'll take this up. All right, so for the first one, uh, you should get this exactly. Now KEQ is NH3 squared, the product, raised to the power of two, divided by NH2, I'm sorry, divided by N2, times H2 to the power of three. Okay, it's power of three because it's a coefficient of three beside the hydrogen. Second one, same idea. You have the product, NO2 squared because of the two, divided by NO squared because the NO has a two, and also divided by oxygen. So the concentration of the product divided by the concentration of the reactant all raised to their relative uh, coefficients. All right, so there are different kinds of equilibrium. There's homogeneous equilibrium, and then there's heterogeneous equilibrium. So homogeneous equilibrium refers to a chemical system in which everybody has the same state of matter, solid, liquid, or gas. Okay, everybody is the same, in this case, all gas. Heterogeneous will be obviously all different. Well, not all different, but quite different. At least two of the states are different. For example, here you have calcium carbonate, a solid. It will decompose into calcium oxide, another solid, and carbon dioxide gas. So now we have two states. So that will be a heterogeneous equilibrium. 
this does make a difference on your equilibrium expression. Okay, so when you write the KEQ expression, you do not include pure solid or pure liquids in the expression. You only include aqueous solutions and gases. Okay, it is a mistake to involve solids and pure liquids in your KEQ expression. Now, why? This is because equilibrium deals with concentration. And it, you need to reach equilibrium from non-equilibrium. So you have to change your concentration. If you have a solid or a liquid, you are unable to change your concentration. It is silly to even talk about the concentration of solids and liquids. We call it density, not concentration. So it doesn't even have a concentration. So if you don't have a concentration and you can't change it, you're not part of the equilibrium. All right, so pure solids and pure liquids, the concentrations, if you want to call it that, do not change. So they're not affected. So thus we don't include them in the equilibrium law. Okay, pure liquids, like water. If it's pure water, it doesn't have a concentration. However, you have more than one liquid, then they can mix with each other, and then you would have a concentration. Okay, but I'm not going to actually give you an example of that. Not going to be on the test at all. Just letting you know, FYI, if you have more than one liquid, then yes, it does count. But if you only have one liquid, no. Okay, we are only going to encounter a situation where there's one liquid. So no, don't include that. So here are two more. For the first one, write the equilibrium law. You do not include the solid. So it's just this. The products multiply together, but don't you divide by the reactants? Well, I did. I divided by one. The reactant becomes one. All right. For the next one, you have three solid zinc plus two chromium three bromide. That's aqueous. It becomes two solid chromium plus three zinc bromide aqueous. And if you want to write the equilibrium law, you have to exclude the pure solids. So zinc, goodbye. Chromium, goodbye. You would then have two aqueous solutions. The KEQ would be zinc bromide raised to the power of three divided by chromium three bromide raised to the power of two. Okay, exclude pure solids and pure liquids. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's do this example. Calculating KEQ for synthesis reactions. Now, just a little background on this reaction because this is quite a famous reaction. Nitrogen and hydrogen combine to form ammonia according to that equation. This is a very significant equation for mankind. All right, this is one of my favorite examples to use. What is this equation? This is called the Haber process. It's invented by a guy, a German dude named Fritz Haber. And I believe it was invented after World War I. Now, why is this significant? Nitrogen is an essential nutrient for plants and animals, especially for plants because they need to derive their nutrients from the environment. Plants can only grow with nitrogen. It's one of the things it needs. You need nitrogen for DNA and proteins. Where do you get nitrogen? Well, you get it from the soil. You cannot get nitrogen from the air. The earth is 78% nitrogen gas, but too bad. That is inert. And a triple bond N, it is so stable. You can't break that triple bond to harness the nitrogen. So too bad, you can't use it. So if we could, if we could only find a way to make nitrogen to become a more usable form, like NH3 or NH4, then the plants can use them. But there's only a limited amount of that in the soil, and if the plant runs out, the plant doesn't grow. So farmers can't grow a lot of food because it's lacking in nitrogen. So here comes Fritz Haber. He invented a process which allows us to generate a lot of ammonia simply by adding nitrogen and hydrogen together. 
And he won the Nobel Prize for that. And because of the Haber process, we're now able to synthesize ammonia from nitrogen. So farmers tripled their yield production, which saved billions of people. You might be saying, wait, what's so special about that? I could think of that. Yeah, just add nitrogen and hydrogen to, to make NH3. Duh. Why did he win the Nobel Prize for this? Well, because this reaction is very difficult to make it like, happen. You can mix nitrogen and hydrogen together. They're not going to react. Okay? It takes a lot of ingenuity to force this reaction to produce any product. Mostly the KEQ will favor the reactant side. If the reverse reaction happens, not the forward reaction. So uh, Haber figured out a way to effectively make this reaction synthesize a lot of NH3. So for that ingenuity, he won the Nobel Prize, not coming up with this equation. So here is the Haber process. We have to calculate the value of the equilibrium constant for this reaction. So calculate KEQ. If the following concentrations were measured at equilibrium at 500 degrees Celsius. The 500 degrees Celsius does not matter. You do not need to use that number. It gives you that number not to confuse you. It's just to let you know that, you know, the, uh, the temperature won't change. So you have the initial concentrations. Figure out the KEQ mathematically. So I'll give you like a minute. Punch this in your calculator and see what you get. All right, so you should have this equation. Uh, we already did the KEQ expression for this, product over reactant. You sub your numbers in, 2.00 times 10 to the negative four, moles per liter for NH3, you square that, divided by 1.50 times 10 to the negative five moles per liter for nitrogen, you don't do anything with that, and also divided by 3.45 times 10 to the negative one moles per liter, but you have to cube that because it's hydrogen. Many people forget the square of the cube. You put this in your handy dandy calculator. In one step, you should get this number. 6.49 times 10 to the negative two. All right, three sig figs, because everybody in the question has three sig figs and you multiply and divide it, so your answer should have three sig figs. Okay, cool. Let's do the same thing for the reverse reaction. So you just take this and you flip it on its side and see what happens. Well, if you reverse this, I'm just gonna show you the answer because if you did the first one, you know how to do this one. Now the products become nitrogen and hydrogen, so that becomes in the numerator and the denominator now has NH3 squared. You drop these numbers in, you will put your calculator and boom, you have 15.4. Again, three sig figs. You might be thinking, um, okay, so are these numbers related? Because this is just the reverse reaction of the previous reaction. So let's compare the KEQ of the forward, the synthesis, to the reverse, the decomposition reaction. All right, so here is the forward reaction. The KEQ is 6.49 times 10 to the negative two, a pathetically small number. The KEQ prime of the KEQ of the reverse reaction is 15.4. Are these numbers related? Do they have anything in common? If you are keen at math, you can realize, wait, the way that we calculated them, yeah, I basically just flipped the fraction. So that means these two numbers are reciprocals of each other. All right, so all you have to do is just flip the fraction. If you flip the fraction, you would go from one to the other. All right, so if, if on a test I give you the KEQ of the forward reaction and I ask you to calculate the KEQ of the reverse reaction, just take the reciprocal and there you have it. All right, so that's what I want to show you, the relationship between the KEQ of the forward and the reverse, they're just reciprocals. Now, what about the magnitude of the KEQ? Their absolute values, does that really have any meaning? Like, what, is, what do you mean I have a KEQ of 6.49 times 10 to the negative two? What can that tell me? Is that a big number or a small number? 
right? And 15.4, is that a big number or a small number? So the magnitude of the KEQ can tell us a lot about the reaction. It tells you where the equilibrium lies. So recall that you have reacted in equilibrium with products, and the KEQ is just concentration of the product divided by the concentration of the reactant. All right, so what that means is KEQ is the ratio of products to reactant. And if this number is bigger than one, then you would have uh, way more products than reactants. So what does that mean? So at equilibrium, you would have more products than reactant. So the equilibrium position lies on the right side, the right side being the side with the products. So we can also say that products are favored. The equilibrium favors the products. If you have a KQ of roughly one, that means the ratio of product to reactant is just one, that means they're the same or very similar. Equilibrium lies in the middle. Okay, at equilibrium, you have almost equal amounts of products and reactants. And lastly, of course, when you have KEQ less than one, if you divide two numbers and you get less than one, that means the reactant is larger than the product. You divide it by a larger number. So products have lower concentrations than reactant at equilibrium, which means the equilibrium favors the left side, the reactant side. At equilibrium, well, you mostly have reactants, very little product. That means this reaction didn't go very far. And that will be the Haber process. The, you try to make ammonia, well, congratulations, the equilibrium is on the left side. You can have this at equilibrium, well, you still have a lot of nitrogen and hydrogen, very few ammonia, so it's not going to work. All right, so that's how you use the magnitude of the KEQ. Is it bigger than one, equal to one, or less than one? And then you can deduce, is it on the left or right? Does, which side does it favor? All right, so that's it for this lesson. We learn about equilibrium, what that means, the conditions for equilibrium, uh, we also talked about the equilibrium constant, KEQ, the equilibrium law equation, how to write the law equation for homogeneous and heterogeneous equilibrium, and also um, the magnitude of the equilibrium constant. What does that tell you about the position of the equilibrium? So, do we have any questions? All right, so I'm going to end this.